Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be looking at a brain in a jar. The brain in the jar first appeared sort of in the movie Frankenstein, but it was not until Donovan's brain in 1953 was the classic brain in a jar used. For decades, the idea of having a living computer belonged to science fiction. But today, that fiction is being reinvented in real time by scientists and engineers, biohackers, all trying to build a new kind of machine, one that's alive. But is it? Where do these neurons come from? So the neurons used in these experiments don't come from embryos or fetuses. That ethical minefield is avoided entirely. Instead, they're derived from adult skin or bone marrow cells, which are reprogrammed into stem cells. And from those stem cells, they're transformed into human neurons. It's cutting edge, it's ethically sound, and it's done with full donor consent. But how long do these neurons live? At first, these lab-grown neurons barely survived an hour. However, with better nutrient baths and environmental controls, in one case they survive up to three months in traditional lab setups. And those are the ones that were done by Final Spark experiments last year. But Cortical Labs and their CL1, which is a commercial system that has built in life support, that extends the lifespan of these neurons to six months. Thanks in part to controlling the amount of gas and temperature and nutrient delivery. Yes, you have to have kind of an incubator for these. So this is a lot different than what we're used to, isn't it? But can they learn? Yes. The answer is yes, they certainly can. Just like artificial neural networks learn through feedback, these living neurons respond to training using dopamine like chemical rewards. So what was once a metaphor in AI has become biology, real neurons, real memories, and real input. Yes, they learn uh, much as we do, and they learn using similar techniques to AI learning on digital computers. Is this ethical? Well, the researchers admit they aren't philosophers, that's why in 2024, they presented at a philosophy conference in Amsterdam to start the conversation. So what rights, if any, does a living computer deserve? And how do we detect consciousness? And should we? So why build a living computer at all? Because traditional AI consumes a staggering amount of energy. It's no secret that AI products are resource hungry. OpenAI's ChatGPT requires a staggering 500,000 kilowatts of power to respond to the 200 million prompts it receives each day. And living neurons, well, let's 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 just compare it this way. When when Final Spark began their journey, they were they were training on digital AI computers. And they were building uh, digital neurons through neural networking to simulate what a, the, a brain of a bee might have. So that'd be a few hundred neurons with each neuron containing tens of thousands of connections. That required about the same amount of energy as 20 washing machines. Well, they were looking at scaling up to the size of the human brain. The, and to do that digitally would have required a nuclear power plant in order to generate enough electricity. So they looked at us. They looked at our brains. Our brains use a tiny amount of electricity in comparison. 
about 27 watts of electricity uh, equivalent. So, and that is the power of a very dim light bulb. This isn't about replacing silicon. It's about augmenting it with something more efficient, more adaptable, and more sustainable, and arguably more human. So when will this become a viable tool? And their answer was about five to seven years, and that was last year. But we're not talking about retail here, or, or, and don't look for sentience. Uh, this isn't Skynet. But as a platform for platform for pattern recognition, adaptive control, or neural science modeling, yeah, five to seven years probably will become viable. In Australia, Cortical Labs has been connecting human neurons, these artificially generated ones, connecting neurons to a Pong game. It receives screen input, it moves the paddles, it learns. And it's not aware of what it's doing. It's not intelligent, but it is learning uh, through a reward system what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do. The other one is in Final Sparks Lab, there's another, or they call these organoids, or neural organoids. And now this, is, this one is guiding a digital butterfly inside of a virtual world. The neurons react to artificial light sources, and they are helping the butterfly navigate toward it. So it's not just reflex, it's learning how to navigate and how to engage with virtual world uh, stimulation. So if you don't have a lab, Cortical Labs now offers a cortical cloud called Wetware as a Service. You can write code, you can send it to their neurons, you can get feedback in real time as to what's going on. You can access biological computing without owning or maintaining the machine. However, if you want to purchase your own, <laughs> your own neural platform, uh, Cortical Labs sells one uh, and they are taking orders for that right now. It should be available sometime in the second half of 2025. It probably will take about 900 watts of, of power in your laboratory in order to be able to support it. There's clusters of four that they're sold in, and they're sold at $35,000 U.S. per unit. So I think, I think the, the turning point is... This started with a goal, and the goal was to reduce the power consumption in order to conduct uh, AI uh, learning experiments. But it confirms something even deeper, and that is the way that we're training machines mirrors the way biology learns. So the lines are blurring between artificial and natural intelligence, if, if you want to call it intelligence, I don't. Uh, but uh, they are definitely, those two worlds are definitely converging. The next challenge, internal feeding systems, because even Cortical Labs says that as you make these more dense, you're going to have to have internal feeding systems. That is, you need something like we have, where you have veins and arteries that are transferring uh, some kind of liquid that contains nutrients and amino acids and salts. The entire system is kept alive and functional by a microfluidic system that continuously supplies the organoids with the nutrients they need to thrive. While the living computer holds incredible promise, there are still significant hurdles to overcome before it can be fully practical and scalable. If you look at our neurons, they last a lifetime. They can last up to, a, you know, 100 years and more. So I think uh, in the final moments, I think uh, this is a new frontier that we are building machines that think, kind of. So is this more than engineering? Yeah, it's definitely more than engineering. It's an awakening of a new kind of platform. Uh, we've taught it to play, uh, but don't look for it to play crisis anytime soon. But one day, it might teach us something back, uh, and that, that's kind of interesting. Now, uh, they're, they're, we'll talk about this at the end, but uh, 
So some will say it's a it's a lie. No, it's not a lie. So ask the only question that matters: Does it dream? That's the question you really should answer. This has been the Cyber Gizmo, and this is where we question uh, things like the machine. We trace the code, and we remind you that not every neuron is a mind. I hope you enjoyed this video today. The thing that what I would like to impress upon you is no this is not the singularity uh this does not it doesn't feel it doesn't have emotions it's not a robotic body it, it there's none of that it is just basically a brain in a jar right so that's basically where we are with this but uh, yeah it is it is a science fiction movie that's for sure hope you enjoyed this i'm dj Ware. hope to see you next time Behind every new technology we develop and every new buzzword we embrace lies immense potential. And the deeper we dive into the details, the more it becomes obvious. The future is going to be shaped by a convergence of AI, OI, and good old human ingenuity.